Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we praise your name. We bow before you humbly, seeking forgiveness for our sins, our transgressions, both individually and corporately as a church. Lord, we, we struggle at times. We have our guide. We have the light of your word to follow. Lord, we still fall on occasion. We are uh, still in the flesh, and when those things happen, Lord, we ask your forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to repent of our sins and live more like Christ, in whose image we are made. And so, Father, it is a blessing to be in your house again this morning. We come into the sanctuary, uh, lifting our voices in praise, giving you all honor and glory lifting your name above all names, dear Lord, to the rightful place where it belongs. We are thankful, uh, Father, that even while we are yet in our sins, you came to this earth in the person of Jesus Christ to pay the penalty that we could not pay, to hang on the cross and bleed your perfect, sinless, precious blood, the only effectual agent whereby our sins might be forgiven. And so, Lord, we are grateful for that. If there are any here today who do not know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, I would pray, Lord, that you would um, trouble their hearts until they know that they are sinners, as we all are. All have fallen short of the glory of God, we're told. Every one of us are sinners, but those trusting in Christ are sinners saved by grace. And so, Lord, I would ask that if any have not done it yet, that they would turn from their sin, that they would ask forgiveness for their sin, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive them and to cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Lord, we thank you that you have taken care of everything. You have secured an eternal home for us in heaven above, where we will glorify you forever and ever. But while we're still yet on this earth, Lord, there are many battles that uh, will still be faced by each of us, again, whether individually, as a church, as the body of Christ, uh, as our nation, dear Lord, our nation uh, that was founded on the very principles of Christianity. It was founded, Patrick Henry said, on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, that is why it is so important to those of us who are Christian and who are patriots to hold on to this nation, which you have given us, and to the freedoms which come only from you. For that we are grateful and thankful, dear Lord. We pray for our country. For Lord, we pray that as we put this year of 2021 behind us, that we can look forward to 2022 and pray, Lord, that it would be a blessing, that for the sake of the righteous in the land, dear Lord, you would bring peace, you would bring healing to our nation, that you would help us to once again, dear Lord, uh, be a leader, uh, be a leader in many respects uh, throughout the world. And by that, I mean by raising up the name of Jesus, by looking to you, dear Lord, our, our, our Father in heaven, to our Lord and Savior, the author and finisher of our faith. We are grateful, Lord, that you have, uh, that you have blessed us, that you have been merciful for all these many years. Lord, forgive us if we, if we ask for for yet more, Lord. The job is not done. We know there are still many that need to be reached for Jesus, and we pray, Lord, that you would give us the peace in our nation whereby we can accomplish that. Father, I pray for all who are here today, all those who have come to visit. They're traveling, perhaps. Uh, they've come. Many of our own people are traveling, and Lord, I just pray safety on them all. Um, get them all back home. Bring them all back home to us uh, safely, dear Lord. We thank you uh, for the holidays when we can gather with family, but we thank you most importantly for the, uh, the times when we set a moment aside to recognize the birth of Christ, also his death and resurrection, which will be coming up in just a few short months. Uh, Lord, we are a blessed people, and we thank you that we can continue to remember these things. Those who are here today that, who are troubled by uh, by whatever, Lord, there are so many troubles in life, uh, we couldn't count them all, but we would pray that you would 
be with them, encourage them, Lord, touch them and heal them. Uh, give them hope, Lord, give them, uh, give them comfort. Give them the peace that only you can give, Father. Pray again, especially for uh, Donna Egner, who is uh, still recovering from surgery, Lord, that you would touch her and make her whole again, Lord, bring her back to us. And for Mrs. Decker, Nita Decker, who is uh, still in the hospital with pneumonia and, and, um, and dehydration, Lord, please uh, touch and heal her, Father, that she might return to us soon as well. And Lord, any I, that I've missed, you know them all by name. Uh, Lord, we lift them to you and we ask your mercy upon them. We pray again for all the missionaries around the world, around the neighborhood, wherever they may be, Lord, who are sharing the gospel message of Jesus. Keep them safe. Bless them. Keep them encouraged. I thank you, Lord, for their servants' hearts. I thank you for all uh, that they do in your name. And Lord, it's in the name of Jesus, our precious Lord and Savior, that I ask these things. Amen. Well, again, good morning. I haven't had a chance to personally greet each of you, but perhaps on the way out, I'll be able to accomplish that. We welcome, uh, as I alluded to in the prayer, all who may be visiting with us. Uh, if you are so led, fill out a visitor's card and you can drop it in the basket on the way out. Uh, there's a blank side to that card if you have any prayer requests, any, any uh, special things that we can take to the Lord for you, please do that as well. We're pleased to have you all with us worshiping today. We will bring in the new year this Friday, uh, finally putting 21 behind us. We were so happy to put 2020 behind us. 2021 wasn't a whole lot better, was it? But uh, the Lord knows. He's in charge. And we look to serve him and uh, do what is right by him. And we will be blessed no matter what is going on in the world or in our country. Uh, but we will gather as we do each New Year's Eve down in the fellowship hall from 9 until midnight. We uh, ask you to uh, bring something for the sharing table if you can, uh, something to eat. Uh, it could be uh, savory or sweet. I will eat it all. And so, uh, again, we're just glad to have you uh, come with us if you're able. Bring board games if you have them. Uh, we usually have some uh, very... Uh, intense Scrabble games going on. I'm looking at the Scrabble players. I checked them out in the pews. And uh, whatever game you have, uh, bring it with you. And, and uh, we will have a good time of fellowship and food. And then at 1130, we'll gather and, uh, and, and have a, a bit of a worship time, a prayer time. And I will hand out your uh, promise for the coming year that we take right out of the Word of God. So if you are able to make it, and for those of you who uh, enjoy the men's prayer breakfast, the first Saturday of every month, uh, if you are at the New Year's Eve fellowship, you won't get as much sleep this time around. We will still have men's prayer breakfast. If you can make it, if you can't, not a problem. Uh, they, I was down there the other day, and they will be open uh, on Saturday. Uh, what else is going on? Our monthly luncheons which we set aside in November and December for obvious uh, busy reasons. They will resume uh, on the second Sunday in January. So that's January 9th this year, the second Sunday. Uh, the Nathansons, Adam and Diana Nathanson, they are our missionaries to Venezuela. They will be here uh, at, our, well, at our service as well, but at our luncheon to share what's been going on. Uh, in their missions work, their ministry down in South America. So please, if again, again, if you can, uh, bring a dish or a dessert uh, and join us if you are able. We have a lot going on in January, our next session meeting, the 10th, Monday the 10th. If you have any concerns or questions, let me or one of the elders know about that. The calendars are in the back. They were a little late getting here this year, but they are on the back table our Constitution calendars. Please pick one up on your way out. Uh, the only other two things that I did not have uh, in the bulletin, the Decker family is planning a birthday party, a 90th birthday party for Mrs. Decker 
on the 15th of January. So that is a Saturday, so what the third Saturday of January. You all are invited. The door is open downstairs at 2. It's being catered at 3. And so please stay and, and have food and fellowship and uh, just be part of the celebration. Now that's the first half of it. The second half is pray that she will be able to attend. <laughs> there are people coming in from, uh, from as far away as Hawaii uh, to celebrate her birthday. She is still in the hospital. I was to see her on, on Wednesday, I guess it was. The days are running together again. I'm going up there again tomorrow to visit with her. She does have pneumonia. She was dehydrated. I suspected that's probably been taken care of by now. There are a couple other issues that are going on. So we just pray. Her faith is very strong. And uh, we pray that she will be back with us very soon. And uh, I'll keep you abreast of the uh, party plans as we're getting closer and closer uh, to that. If you have any photos or memories in picture form of Mrs. Decker and you, um, please bring them. They'd like to put together a, a scrapbook of some sort. I guess they do all that digitally now. And the only other thing is we would like to offer the poinsettias to a good home. So after church today, if you see one you like, there's one in the back. There's three in the back, actually. Um, if any down there strike your fancy, please, please take one and enjoy it. And uh, we will be happy and you will be happy. So I think that's all that I have, Dennis. Uh, where are we at? Special music. We had some terrific music to begin our service. Thank you, uh, Vaith Men, for playing the saxophones. Uh, we have been blessed with um, very talented musicians in this church, not the least of which is Susan Walton. So, so it's all yours, Susan. <laughs>
All the Lord's people said, amen. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. I'd like to take a few moments like we do every time this year, or every year this time, should say that right, to recognize or to acknowledge the people in our church who have really done a lot of work behind the scenes during the year. Uh, some of us are obvious, others are not so obvious. And so as I call your name, if you would come forward, uh, we have a card for you. And um, we want to express our appreciation for all that you've done. So I will start. We'll go alphabetically, so you won't be caught off guard. Larry Barger, who is our um, electrician and et cetera, anything else we need him for. Once you come here to do something, you're liable to be asked to do something else. So uh, Larry does that. Um, uh, the very thankless job of taking out the garbage every week. Larry does that. That's how good he is. So you might as well come up because there's going to be a few of you. And, uh, of course, his wife, Carol, who is our secretary and does such a fine job all year long. We are appreciate, appreciative, rather, of her service. And then, of course, thank you, Carol. Appreciate it. Uh, Dennis Egner, who you see up front with the worship, but he also uh, works behind the scenes as well with getting all the offerings counted every week. We thank you and take Donna's as well. Uh, Donna, who helps him in that regard. And Dan Harris, where is Dan? Now, come on up, Dan. We, uh, <clears throat> you learn to appreciate Dan <clears throat> every time you use the restroom. Dan is the paper man. He makes sure we have an adequate supply of all the paper we need, as well as the water in the back uh, and the refrigerator. If you're not aware of that, there's a little refrigerator in the back uh, that holds bottled water, so please uh, avail yourself of that and anything else. Pie, plates, the plasticware that we use during our luncheons. Uh, Dan is on top of that. Uh, Jason, if you come forward, our uh, security guard, we appreciate uh, just the fact that he's there, just his very presence uh, keeps the bad guys driving up the road and not turning into the parking lot. So we are grateful, again, Jason, for uh, uh, your your faithfulness. Jason is here uh, every week, and we are grateful for that. Appreciate all your work, brother. And Gail, if you would come up. Uh, Gail Lewis, the pastor's wife, yes. She, she does a lot of obvious work that you see, but uh, she heads up uh, and gets the ball rolling on our Operation Christmas Child, our Child Evangelism Fellowship, our Solid Ground Ministry, there's probably a few things I've, I've missed there, but uh, she does so much work behind the scenes in that regard. Uh, Larry Long, our brother Larry, just as Larry Barger is our electrician, Larry is our plumber, etc. cetera. Uh, when we get him here to <clears throat> turn a few wrenches, we often find other stuff for him to do. He's no stranger to a paintbrush in his hand either, I might add. So thank you, Larry, for all that you do. And Nancy, who has played the piano, yes. <clears throat> I, didn't, I didn't bring a biscuit for Toby, so you'll have to hand her off for, I wasn't thinking of that. <laughs> Nancy um, has done uh, such a good job uh, with the piano for so long, and uh, this year is no, uh, <clears throat> Uh, nothing different. You've done, done it as well this year. Uh, keeping it in the family, Josh, who is their grandson and uh, helps man the sound booth uh, for us in the back, and Daryl Palmer, who is back there with them. Uh, Daryl is our um, IT guy. He, uh, he's really the engine that keeps the church running. Any uh, problems we have that nobody knows anything about, Daryl usually can fix. So, Josh, thank you. We're very grateful, and Daryl, uh, to you as well. Uh, Daryl, by the way, is, knows what 24-7 is because I've called him all different times of the night saying, help, we have church tomorrow, 
We don't know how to get this thing started. Our associate pastor, uh, Brother Ron Rivers, if you would come forward as well. And uh, speaking of 24-7, and uh, if you check his suit coat out, I pretty much guarantee he has a sermon in there. We have to always be ready, right, brother? Amen. Uh, Linda Steimel and Sally Strachan, who take our children's church. Sally, I think, is out of town with family this weekend, uh, but Linda is with us. If you drove by the, uh, the church property on Friday, I have to remember my days here, Christmas Eve, uh, you might recognize Linda as Mary and Ron as Joseph. And Susan back there also uh, played Mary for us in our first ever live nativity scene. So I think it went well enough. We are going to uh, continue that. Jack and Mello Vaith, please come up. The beautiful music you give us. Again, every month, uh, the work that you put in uh, for that as well. It is much, much appreciated. And obviously, you've passed it on to the next generation. And uh, make sure they get you to dinner off of this, okay? Guaranteed. <laughs> Guaranteed. There you go. And Susan, yes. Do not want to forget Susan, who holds it all together musically for us. God bless you. All these wonderful musicians we have. And Bridget, I don't see Bridget today, but Bridget has uh, worked in our office all year and is uh, taking on a new task uh, up in the library this coming year. So again, I, I can't thank you all enough. This is uh, a very small token of our appreciation. So thank you. We can applaud that. They, they've done a good job. Ladies and gentlemen, amen. Now, as we've been trying to get every Christmas carol ever written uh, into our church services in this month of December, uh, we will ask uh, Dennis to stand and lead us in the singing of uh, yet one more. Please stand for our next hymn, number 132, Angels We Have Heard on High.
reading would be Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Thank you. The Word of God tells us, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, the son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus." Please be seated. Now the pastor's message, Answering God's Call, Part 2. Part 2, because Part 1 last week concerned Mary, so we want to look at Joseph today. As we said last week, God has a purpose for each and every one of us in this life, and he uses opportunities, especially during the Christmas season, to testify to this. We've talked about the fact that you hear the name of Jesus in the public square or the public sphere this time of year, as you do at Easter, a uh, little more so than, than at other times. And my prayer is that all of us would properly recognize and discern the opportunities that the Lord gives to us that we might uh, share some thoughts about Jesus. You don't have to give a complete gospel message. Let them know who Jesus is. Let them know what he's done for you in your life. And as they question you, maybe wanting to know more, um, pray that it would lead to the presentation of the gospel. We learned last week that Mary had a purpose and applied it by way of her availability her husband Joseph, as we'll see today, showed his purpose and application through his obedience. We can learn from both. I think it's wrong to automatically assume that we could not possibly have the impact on the world through our faith to the degree that Mary and Joseph did. Well, we have different callings, don't we? There's no question that their earthly calling was unique. There's also no question that we all worship and serve the same Christ. So there is a calling for each of us as well. Our calling is similar in that we have all been commissioned to take Christ into all the world. Mary and Joseph brought him into the world. Now it is up to us to take him to the world, sharing, again, the love that we find in the gospel message with those whose paths we happen to cross. Now, Joseph is often the forgotten figure of Christmas, but he was certainly irreplaceable at that first one. In fact, even though nothing he had to say was recorded anywhere for us in the scriptures, his importance cannot be overstated. He's not even the Bible's most famous Joseph. Yet three times in the first two chapters of Matthew, he is visited by angels. Who among us can claim even one angelic visit, much less three? All of the people in the Christmas story had speaking parts. The angels, the shepherds, the wise men, and of course, Mary. So in today's culture of selfies, photo ops, sound bites, 
Joseph would be irrelevant because he would be oblivious. But he was not oblivious to God. Joseph's life had purpose. So again, as we go through this, I want to ask you to plug yourself into this equation. Do you often feel small, like you don't have much to do in God's great plan for eternity? Like your life is fairly meaningless? Please don't go there. You were created, each and every one of you were created in God's image. You cannot start out in life any better than that. And then, if you need any more confirmation of your importance to the Lord, your place in this grand plan of his salvation that he has begun so many years ago and continues to this day, look no further than your salvation. You are so important to God that he came to this earth to die on your behalf. And if it was only for you that he did this, he still would have come. He still would have gone to the cross. So from God's perspective, our lives have purpose. What we need to do a better job of is putting that purpose into motion. We can all talk a good game, right? But do we walk the walk? Maybe. I know I can do better. And I think collectively as a church, as a body of Christ, we can do better. We've already seen here in our own fellowship, just through our missions outreach and our radio outreach, just how much God can do with what little we have. Please don't think also that I'm, that I'm beating on the sheep here today. I'm not. But if we, and again, I'm, when I say we, I mean the entire body of Christ around the world, if we ever sold out to God, just what would he accomplish through us? We see what he did through Joseph. Through Joseph, God protected the unborn life of Jesus, and he preserved him through his early years. Stop for a minute and wonder, do you think Mary could have made that trip from Bethlehem down to Egypt with a newborn baby? Do you think she'd have done that on her own? Joseph was obedient to God's will, but his obedience didn't have an attitude with it. It wasn't like a soldier doing push-ups for insubordination or a prisoner doing hard labor for a crime that he has committed against humanity. It was clear that Joseph, Joseph the carpenter, who I'm sure had calloused hands, I'm sure he also had a tender heart. We see it right at the top of our text. Verse 19 then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, a just man, a righteous man, a believing man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Right up front, we're told he's a man of mercy. The second part of verse 18 also tells us of the predicament that he found himself in. The predicament was that Mary was found to be with child. I'm sure some of his feelings were not unlike some of Mary's feelings that we talked about last week. If nothing else, the revelation of a pregnancy was certainly going to alter their plans. It still does that today, doesn't it? When a pregnancy enters into the life of of a family or a young lady. It alters people's plans. But unfortunately, a lot of times today, instead of people working it out with God's help, they choose to terminate that which they see as being just an inconvenience. 
Please understand, God wants to hear from you when you are in trouble. You in here today who are parents, you know what I'm talking about. When your child is in trouble, you want him coming to you, don't you? Not the knuckleheads down on the corner. They don't have your children's best interests at heart. You want them to come to you. Well, God is no different. He wants what is best for his children, too. Joseph obviously loved Mary. He proposed marriage to her. And in keeping with the Jewish tradition regarding his engagement, Joseph was committed to Mary. But he had to have some questions. He was human, too. He probably felt betrayed at some point, no doubt heartbroken. What was it Mary had done? Who was the father of this child? With all the questions he probably had going on in his mind, his true character was revealed before he received an explanation. And it was an angelic explanation at that. Again, we're told because Joseph was a just man, he did not want to humiliate Mary. That's a man of character. We don't readily see that in our culture today. Unmarried women are embarrassed. Or they're not embarrassed, rather, by their pregnancies. In fact, for some, it's a badge of honor. I've heard some people tell me, well, at least I didn't have an abortion. Well, thank God for that. The men can be just as promiscuous today as the women. Children, I think for the most part, have always been a cause of pride for their fathers. But pride in promiscuity is misplaced pride. Some of our sports stars today are men who have fathered several children, but with several different women. And yet many people don't say anything wrong with that. As long as you're scoring touchdowns or hitting home runs, we can justify anything. We truly live in a time that Isaiah prophesied about when he said, Woe well unto them who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Isaiah 5, verse 20. But Joseph was merciful. Joseph had a tender heart, not a bitter one. He wasn't demanding some sort of justice here. Joseph did have an, ancest did have an ancestor by the name of Judah, one of the sons of Jacob, who, being blinded by his own promiscuous sin, demanded justice to be done to his unmarried pregnant daughter-in-law. He ordered her thrown in a fire and burned to death. But we know how quickly he changed his tune when she revealed that the baby was his. It was the righteous mercy of Joseph which preserved the life of Mary, thereby preserving the unborn Christ. Saving their lives was certainly the most important aspect of Joseph's mercy, but there were residual benefits because of it. Their betrothal was still intact, and the conception would be protected by marriage. Better for someone to one day ask, isn't this the son of a carpenter, rather than isn't this the son of a harlot? The traditional engagement back then was six to 12 months. Although the contract for marriage was in place before the Immaculate Conception, we are told in verse 18 that Mary was beginning to show. As all you moms know, that starts to happen, doesn't it? It was probably after her three months' stay with cousin Elizabeth that Joseph took note of this. Matthew Henry once said, those in whom Christ is formed will show it. So we ask the question, do people see Jesus when they look at you? Jesus was a hot topic 
of conversation that first Christmas as a baby. Imagine the discussions that we can all have about him now, now that we know what he did and why he came to us. Are you prepared to have those conversations, again, with others who God sends to cross your path? Verses 20 and 21 give us some insight into the workings of God. Joseph is here pondering the situation. Again, because he was a just man, he was deliberating. Again, unlike his ancestor Judah before him who rushed to judgment, Joseph had more patience and with that, more grace. Don't you find that by withholding immediate judgment, by sleeping on it, that you often find a better solution? Again, that's exactly what happened to Joseph. He had carried the matter as far as he could in his own mind. Then God came in with advice. Wait upon the Lord. That's the message. Wait upon the Lord. Now God was ready to let Joseph in on the plan. And so the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream. When we quiet ourselves down, when we compose ourselves, we're often in the best frame of mind to receive the notices of the divine will. What does it say on the front of the bulletin? Somebody read that. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Quiet it down a little bit. What was the saying back in the 60s? Stop the world. I want to get off. It starts spinning a little too quickly. We need to slow it down. The spirit moves on calm waters. God was ready to call Joseph to faith, to believe. So Joseph's eyes were opened to a glimpse of the divine plan and his part in it. In the dream, God reminded Joseph of his identity. The angel said, thou son of David. Perhaps to remind him that the Messiah, as everyone knew, would be a descendant of David. The God who watches over his plans and purposes for your life wants you to know who you are in him. Joseph was God's man for this particular portion of God's plan, the birth of Jesus. Did you know that in Christ you have a special identity as a member of his family? And that God knows who you are. And because of that, you too have a part in his plan. So be receptive to it, just as Joseph was. Joseph was obedient. God gave him directions, and Joseph followed them. He followed them without understanding them completely. He trusted in God and obeyed him. We always want all the details, don't we? Got to have all the details before I do anything. It's not how faith works. Joseph trusted God and he obeyed him. I, I can't stress how big a tip that is. Is it any wonder that God knew Joseph was thinking about Mary and her pregnancy? He knows what you're thinking about too. But through the angel, the Lord said, Fear not, Joseph. Take her as your wife. I'm in this. It's going to be okay. When left to our own devices, what happens? We let the devil get in the details. When God gives direction, be teachable. Allow his instruction. It's a great mercy to be delivered from our fears. It's a great mercy to have our doubts resolved. And all of this, we know, was done to fulfill the scriptures. The angel said in verse 22, 
Matthew, who wrote his gospel to the Jews, observed this more frequently than the others. Joseph knew that Isaiah had said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. And from the beginning, all the way back to the Garden of Eden, that's where it was first proclaimed that a virgin would give birth to the Savior. Genesis 3.15. That the Messiah should be born of a virgin, the seed of the woman, not the seed of any man. Had to be a virgin. There was no man's seed involved. And that his name would be Jesus, a Savior, for he would be God with us, which is Emmanuel, the name given by Isaiah. Faith is believing according to the promise of God's word. And Joseph showed his faith through his obedience. As God informs our faith, our hope is strengthened to trust him with our circumstances. Is there any doubt that if God can save your soul from hell, that he can not only or not also rescue you from life's troubles? Is there any problem in this life that you can compare to an eternity in hell? Then why do we try to shorten the arm of God? Gabriel told Mary that nothing was impossible with God. Through his virgin birth, Jesus righted the fall. He made what Adam and Eve lost right again. He brought man back into right standing with God. Yet we often drag our feet, working deals with everybody but the devil himself. We're in good company. No less a saint than Moses wondered how 600,000 footmen would be fed meat for an entire month. What did God tell him? Is the Lord's hand waxed short? And this... This, only two years after the Lord had parted the Red Sea. I know it's easy for me to say, but that particular miracle, I think, would have still been real fresh in my mind. Let's look at the last two verses. The dream is over. Joseph is waking up. This dream made such an impression on him that he woke right up. And he did as he was instructed. He woke up and he went to work. Men of God obey. Men and women of God obey. Do it now. It's God's time. And his timing is always the best time. If the Lord is seeking your attention, listen to him. Don't put him off. There's nothing more important you have to do if God is trying to get your attention. The thief on the cross put him off, and look how God got his attention. You don't want to end up like that. We may not receive extraordinary direction like Joseph did, but God still has ways of making himself known to each of us. He speaks to us from his word. Are you reading your Bible? Why do we say read it every day? Because you're going to have trouble every day. Get a good start in the morning by reading the word of God. He also gives us insight through others. And by taking his direction, we will find that he makes our path safe. Not always easy, but always brought through to completion. Trust and obey. It might not make sense from a human perspective. So what? We're looking for divine guidance here. And we recognize that his ways, or we should for sure recognize that his ways are not our ways. God meant for the Christ child to be born in spite of all of Satan's efforts to stop that. And remember, what God has begun, he will perform. Philippians 1.6, you might want to look that up. And when you do, hold fast to that promise. God will keep you safe.
but the place of obedience that he sends you into may not be comfortable. For sure, Joseph and Mary were taken out of their comfort zone, traveling some 70 miles, Mary on the back of a mule, to Bethlehem, Joseph walking the whole way so that Jesus would be born in the place that was prophesied. He not only took them out of their comfort zones for the birth, but also right after that as well, when he instructed Joseph to take Mary and the baby to Egypt. Egypt, remember, held memories, bad memories of oppression and slavery for the Jewish people. I mentioned earlier a more famous Joseph in the Old Testament who was sold as a slave into Egypt by his own brothers for what they meant for evil. God meant for good. Keep that thought in your mind as well. Moses was commanded to return to Egypt and face Pharaoh so that he could set the children of Israel free. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were condemned to a fiery furnace in Babylon. Daniel faced the lions. And Jesus was obedient, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. God's promises are preserved for us in places of obedience. The Herods of yesterday, today, and tomorrow cannot destroy you in a place of obedience. Obedience is the response of someone who is in a relationship of trust with God. You can, be, you can be obedient to him because you trust him. We trust God. We depend on him. We interact with him. But it is God who takes the lead. Samuel told Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. Because we're letting God be God. And staying in our proper place with him. And that place is the place of dependence. Dependence and surrender to his goodness. Be confident, as Joseph was, that God has a plan for each and every one of your lives. And that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, we thank you for the promises that you give us that are just as true for us today as they were for Mary and Joseph 2,000 years ago. We thank you, Lord, for Mary making herself available. We thank you for Joseph being obedient. We thank you that both of them did not have to know all the details, yet they were willing to move forward because with you nothing is impossible. Lord, I pray that that is the message we will take with us into the new year. Let's leave 2021 behind. Let us, let us look forward to what God will do for us in the coming year. And whether it's good, bad, or ugly, dear Lord, we pray that we would walk closely with you at the ready to be used by you in this great plan of redemption which is unfolding before our very eyes we also are pieces of that great puzzle. Use us, dear Lord. Use us as you see fit. And Lord, one day we will all cross that other shore in glory in heaven above with you forever and ever. Bless us now as we depart. Keep us all safe this coming week, dear Lord. Bring us back Friday night for those who can make it, Saturday morning, Sunday morning for sure. We thank you, Lord, for all you do in Christ's name. Amen.